In this week's video, what I want to do is show you the reasons that I use Photoshop over Lightroom. Hi, fantastic to see you all again. Okay, back to a midweek video. And what I want to talk about this week is Photoshop and when I use Photoshop. Now, most of the time, I don't use Photoshop. I use Lightroom because I find Lightroom just easier to use. Um, I take a lot less time when I use Lightroom and it can do 95% of the things that Photoshop can do. The other thing is that Lightroom's good because you're, you're editing the raw image, whereas if you take it into Photoshop, then um, you, you're using Camera Raw to, to edit it, but then when it's in Photoshop, you've got to choose a color space and you're editing it in that color space. In Lightroom, you're using um, Profoto RGB color space, which is, uh, to edit it, and, and but you're actually editing that raw data, which makes a difference. And then I, I prefer printing from Lightroom as well, because again, I'm just going straight back to that raw data and printing through the Lightroom engine. So, yep, Lightroom is my preferred choice, but there are certain times when I have to go into Photoshop. So I'm gonna quickly go through five of those now. The first is pretty obvious. So take this photo here. This is uh, a photo in the field behind where I live. I'm lucky to live on, on a farm. Um, it's fairly flat, but it's got some amazing oak trees. So I took um, this oak tree in some stunning light. We've had blue skies unbelievably in England recently, but we had this really nice light. So I went out and, and took this. I've edited it in Lightroom but I've got a few things that I wanna do in, in Photoshop. So I just wanna remove this cow water trough down here. Now, if you try and do this in Lightroom, you can probably do it if you mess around enough, but it is a little bit tricky to line it up. And sometimes it does weird things when you've got elements that aren't quite similar in the scene. And this is where I find that Photoshop does a lot better job of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to right click on that and then edit in Photoshop. So we've now got it in Photoshop. And all I'm gonna do, just a quick thing on this is I'm just going to lasso that and do what's called content aware fill. So content aware fill is really clever because it looks at the content around um, and fills based on that on that content and you can be selective now with content aware fill which is which is even better So I'm just going to zoom into a hundred percent and we'll just lasso this now What I want to do is I want to make sure I don't get the hedge at the top So I'm just going to be really careful there And I'm just going to lasso that I could probably get those posts as well But I might crop those out of my image. So I'm not too worried about those I'm going to go to content aware fill and now in content aware fill the green is what it's going to select from and I can choose or remove what I want it to select from so I don't want it it's not a tree down here it's just grass so I'm going to get rid of all the tree up there and probably this hedge as well and that's it so it's now just going to select from the grass area and click OK and you can see that that's done a really good job of, of removing that, that trough. And I can do obviously similar for, for these fences as well. So I can now close that um, and save it and that'll just save it in, in Lightroom. I've now got a version of that in Lightroom. Now what you've got to remember, that version that I've now got in Lightroom is saved as a TIFF image. So what I tend to do is anything that I remove, I do as the last thing. Um, so anything that I want to do in Photoshop, I tend to do at the end of, of my editing in Lightroom because when it brings it back in, it brings it as a TIFF. Now you can, if you want, edit and open it as um, a, a smart object in Photoshop. And what that will mean is it's quite smart so that when you go back and edit that in Photoshop, it'll keep all the layers that you've got. But for something like this, where I'm just removing it, it's, it's fine. Okay, so the next thing I do in Photoshop is focus stacking. And I've got two images here to give you an example of how easy that is to do. So I've got an image here that hasn't got the foreground in focus, but it's got the background in focus. So the mountains in the background are sharp, um, but it actually goes soft on the rocks in the foreground. And then this image has got the rocks sharp, but the mountains are soft. Now this image as well, um, I've, I've exposed it a little bit better for the foreground as well. So now what I can do is I can select those two images now these are perfectly aligned so you can see if I just go between the two they are perfectly aligned I didn't move my camera when I took these shots so I can select them both and I can go edit in 
Um, and I'm going to open them as layers in Photoshop. So this is going to open these as layers in Photoshop. So now you can see I've got two layers in Photoshop. The foreground is sharp and the top one is the mountain is sharp. So what I want to do is I want to show the bottom one at the bottom and show the top one at the top. So all I'm going to do, there's lots of different ways to do this. You can select both of them and, and in Photoshop, I can just go edit auto blend layers and I can stack the layers. And if I did that, it will go and find the, the areas um, that are sharp within the image and stack them together. And you can see that it's created a mask here for each one of them. Now, I tend to not use that um, because I find that although it does a reasonably good job, sometimes, and you can see here, there's elements of it where it has thought that the sky is the foreground. Um, so it's not as clever as, as you first think. So although it looks quite good, I found on prints where I've done this before, the elements of it are soft or sharp where they shouldn't be. So I don't do that. What I do is I, I usually only have two images well, as well when I focus stack. What I do is I take these two layers and the top layer, I just add a mask on. So I'm just going to add a layer mask onto the top layer. And what that's going to do is allow me to show elements of the layer below it. So all I need to do on that layer mask is anything that's white shows the top layer. Anything that's black shows the layer below. So what I'm going to do is on this, I'm going to make the bottom part black of this mask. So I just need to go to this tool here, which is a graduated filter. I've got um, black and white here and I can just do that and you can see that it's blended those two together. Now what I've got to do is I've got to decide where I want that blend. Now I obviously don't want it here because it's going to make the sea a bit weird because the waves move in. So you don't want it in anywhere that's moving. And here both of the images were fairly well focused. So I'm just going to blend it about there. And once I've done that, I always have a look at 100% and just check that that looks okay. And you can always go in and mess about with it if it doesn't. But I think that's looking pretty good. So I'll just fit that on screen. And that is all you need to do. It's so easy to do um, a focus stack with a, a, a mask like that. Now, if you've got three images, you know, or you're stacking a macro shot, then I probably wouldn't do it this way. But for most of the things that I do, where I've focused on the foreground and the, and the background, then I'm using a, a mask like this. Actually, I should say something about this image. This is such an amazing place in Lafota, and I'll put the name of the, the location just down below. But it's a bit of a hike to get to this beach. But, oh, we, we, we should have spent more time here on the workshop because I, I think there's so many different compositions here. Um, I'm really pleased with this one. I think this is an image maybe I've shared before, um, but it, it required focus stacking because um, even with a 16 millimeter, or in, in, this might have even been a 14 millimeter lens, I was so close to this rock in the foreground, I couldn't get everything in focus, even at like f16. So I focus stacked it. So now I can just close that and save, and that's now going to save that as a separate file, a TIFF file back in Lightroom. And what you've got to remember though is it is a separate image now. I'm now not editing those raw images. I'm editing this TIFF file, which is really high quality and you know it's, it's got all the data of, of those files, um, but you just need to be aware of that. So the third thing is similar to the focus stacking, but actually stacking two photos that were taken just slightly different time apart or with a different exposure length. Now, this is going against probably something that I said in my last video, which is I don't like replacing the sky. But I think if you're combining two images that you've taken really close together um, to create an effect that you felt when you were in that location, then, then for me, that's okay. If you're just replacing the sky with a sky that you've not taken from somewhere else, then that doesn't seem right. So this is a good example of that. So this is the combined image. Um, you can see here that um, I've combined two images, one which is this image of the water and the other which is this image of the sky. And you can see that I took them on the tripod at roughly the same time. I've talked about this image before, I'll link the video here. But the reason I did this is because I like the sky best on this photo and I like the water best on this photo. And I felt when they linked together and I toned them nicely, 
then they created a really, really nice image. And that was more like how I felt when I was taking the photo. And to do that, I did it exactly the same way. I opened them as layers and used a graduated mask to combine the two layers together, the same way as I did with the focus stacking. Okay, the fourth thing um, is about the Orton effect. Now, probably everyone's heard about the Orton effect. This was first developed by Mr. Orton. Um, I think it was in the 80s, actually, where he was st stacking slide films together. And it's something I used to do myself with slide films. Um, I didn't actually know about Orton then, but I used to stack slide films together to try and create different effects. But now it's super easy to do with layers in Photoshop. So what I do on some of my images, and this is a good example actually, is when I want to create that sort of soft look, and it's something that, that painterly look that I like in my photos, when I've edited it in Lightroom, if I can't achieve that by just reducing the clarity in certain areas, then I'll open up Photoshop and do it. Now this is a good example of wanting to be able to open this as a smart layer. So I'm going to edit this um, and open as a smart object in Photoshop. So what this will do is it will allow me, when I, if I want to re-edit it in Photoshop, to open those layers back up in Photoshop and tweak it a little bit. So if I'm not happy with it, when I've done some more edits in Lightroom, you know, it's not destructive, I can go back to it and change it. So that is open now in Photoshop, and here we have it. We've got it as a, a smart object there. Now I'm gonna quickly go through um, my autumn effect. I'm not. I'm just going to talk about it very briefly because it, it's the way I do it is a combination of lots of different ways I've seen before, and then some of my own things. There's no right or wrong way to do this because, it, after all, it's just art. Um, and I'll probably do another video on. It. In fact, let me know in the comments below if you'd like me to do a video specifically on different things you can do with the autumn effect. So I've got my layer here. I'm just going to duplicate this layer by just dragging it down onto the new layer. I then. Um, just go into this and I'm just going to create a layer mask whilst it's like this. So to do that you just click command on the Mac and then click it and it just basically um, selects all the highlights within the image and then I'm just going to click mask from that and you can see here that I've created this layer mask which is actually looks like a black and white image but basically what it's doing is all the black areas aren't going to show all the white areas are going to show from any changes that I make in this mask and I can actually change the density of that really easily as well so now I'm going to go back to this um, and I'm going to create a Gaussian blur on this I'm just going to go to filter blur Gaussian blur I tend to do it around about 44 um, because that's the megapixels of my camera. And I've now got this as a smart filter as well, so I can go back to it and change it if I want to. Now this looks horrendous, but don't worry about it. We're just gonna change this shortly. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a curve layer and I'm gonna pin that to this layer. So this curve layer just affects the layer below it. And I'm gonna just add a very high contrast on that because I want to really impact the highlights on this. So again, this is looking horrendous, isn't it? Um, but now I'm gonna go back to this and I'm just going to create um, a screen layer on this. Now, sometimes I use soft light, sometimes I use screen. I'm not gonna go into the details of why and when, but I'm gonna add a screen layer on that. And that's pretty much it. It's now a case of just toning that to taste. And there's two things you can do to do that. The first one, is I can change the opacity of this, so I can turn it completely off or completely on. I usually have it around about 25%. And then I can also change the density of my um, mask. And this basically, lower density creates a stronger effect because it affects more of the tones within the image. So I'm gonna turn this down to maybe around about 50. And you can see that that's the effect. You can see it's quite subtle, but what it's doing is it's just creating a soft, a feel, a feel, ethereal, can't say that, ethereal look around the leaves and around the bright areas here. And it looks great. Um, so that's one way of doing the autumn effect and a, a reason that I use Photoshop. And, and um, sometimes I'll do some other things with those layers as well, but th th that's the main main way I do it. Okay, by the way, I only do this probably on about 5% of my images, so very, very rarely. 
Okay, so let's talk about the fifth thing that I use Photoshop for, and that's using Nick Effects. It's something I've used for a long time. Okay, so we'll go back into Photoshop. Now, I use Nick Effects mainly to do conversions to black and white. Um, if I can't, if I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm having much success doing it in Lightroom. So, and I used to use this all the time. So the Nick collection is quite good. You've, the two things I use are Color Effects Pro or Silver Effects Pro. Um, and by the way, there's a link below to the Nick, Nick collection if, if you want to have a look at it. I don't think you really need it if I'm honest, um, but it's good to do quick things and, and have a play around with. So, and you can also do quite a good autumn effect with the Glamour Glow in Color Effects Pro as well. But if I go into Silver Effects Pro, then I find it a good way of playing with doing black and white conversions. So one of the ones that I use is this fine art process one. I find this does a reasonably good job. I also use the graduated filter ones as well, um, depending on the image really. But it's a good way of just messing about and playing with different processes quite quickly and getting quite simple visualizations of what it might look like in black and white. And I think it does a really good job of it. So that's Nick Effects. Um, and then really, I only use Photoshop for doing things like adding borders or um, you know, editing my thumbnails for YouTube or any batch processing. So if I want to batch resize things, then I'll go into Photoshop and I'll use the scripts within Photoshop to batch resize things. All those sort of things, there's loads of YouTube videos about and you can go and have a look at. So this was miles longer than I expected it to be. Um, but hopefully that's some help. I get questions lots of times about Photoshop. Why don't you use Photoshop rather than Lightroom? You know, the reality is that I only use it about 5% of the time. And, that, and what I mean by that is only on probably five, at most 10% of my photos. Um, and the thing I probably use it for most is the content aware fill in, if I'm honest. If somebody took it away from me, it probably wouldn't be the end of the world, but it is useful for some things. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. Um, if you've liked it, then give it a thumbs up and comment below if you've got any ideas for Photoshop for other, other users, any top tips for how you may use it. It's always useful to look through the comments. And until Sunday, when I might actually be out in a field somewhere, bye. The